Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Let's please stand. I'm going to open us up with a prayer, and then I'm going to introduce our, our guest speaker. In gratitude to God, let us lift our minds, hearts, and souls to his strength. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Abba, Father God, you are an all-consuming fire of everlasting life, of light and love. You so love the world that you sent your Son to cast fire on the earth, that by his incarnate love, his sacrificial gift of himself on the cross, and the grace and truth of his resurrection, that we may be transformed in perfect unity with your light, life, and love. You, Jesus so loved the world that before he gave his last breath for us on the cross, he gave us his mother to be our mother, that she who was most filled with the fire of your love may also accompany us by the effect of her fullness of grace to grow in your image and likeness, and that we too may be one, perfectly one with you in the fire of your love. May your protection through this, the five wounds of Jesus be upon us all, that we may be strengthened in the spiritual battle for the salvation of our souls, and by your grace and the intercession of Mary and the saints, persevere in your path of what it means to be holy, as you alone are holy. And it is through the Immaculate Heart of Mary that we commend our spirit into your care, that your kingdom may come, that your will may be known, and your love may be done. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It is with great, a grateful heart and a joyful enthusiasm that I would like to introduce the guest speaker for whom you have come. You're welcome to be seated. And our guest speaker, John Sullivan, is the International Assistant Coordinator of the Flame of Love. It has enriched him in the Holy Gospel through the Flame of Love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So without any further ado, please welcome John Sullivan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming, surrounding me. <laughs> in fact, I was going to come down in front so I could be a little closer, but there are so many of you. It is a delight to see. I mentioned to the group with whom I spoke at Brown Noon today, many of whom came again, that actually Carmel is very dear to me, that many times, actually, I had pursued Carmel. And every time, God seemed to say, nope. <laughs> <laughs> There's something else for you, something else that I want you to do. But it's always been very dear to me, e even, even down to the footwear. <laughs> but what I do want to talk about tonight, in such a, a beautiful place that honors Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the whole Carmelite spirituality, was to talk about the very important connection between Carmel and the flame of love. And as someone who has so admired Carmel, to share with you my thoughts of how important what Carmel does is to the world. For the world so desperately needs to see the face of Jesus. The world needs to see what Jesus looks like. Now, we have wonderful seasons in the church, but strangely, one of my favorite times liturgically of the year is the very beginning of ordinary time. And we read these messages of Jesus coming in and speaking as no one ever spoke, of bringing such light into the world. You can sense something has changed. Change, you can sense the power with which he is sweeping into the darkness and dispersing the darkness with light. And we need this again. But something has changed from then. And often when I meditate on that third luminous mystery of Jesus coming in and proclaiming the gospel, I think, how do we do that to sinners? 
You know, those who felt outcast, the, the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors. And he gave them hope that God still loved them and cared for them. And it was such a, an a, a invigorating, such an enlightening message. But today, things have changed so much that the people we most need to reach often don't think of themselves as sinners. The vocabulary has changed. You speak of repentance, people have no idea what it is. We speak of sin, and it's fun. It's what we want to do. And we live in this very confused time. Most of the people I think we know would think of themselves as very good and well-meaning people. And so it seems. When we look around at the people we see, I think most of us know mostly good people. As I say, I, I don't know a whole lot of axe murderers. <laughs> and I don't know a whole lot of serial killers. But I did hire one once, which is why I always check references now. <laughs> and I did, really. But you see, most of us look around and we see kind and good people. And if the world is filled with such kind and good and loving people, why is it such a mess? We have a world that is very confused about love, that is very confused about goodness. A world, I think, again, thinking of Carmel, I think of Elijah. And the people were so confused, right? He says, how long will you go halting between two opinions? They hadn't completely forsaken God, but they had gone after Baal. They were confused and didn't know right from wrong and up from down, very much like we have today, because we've gotten love wrong. And if you get love wrong, you've gotten everything wrong. God is love, it's the foundation of everything. And we live in a world where we look at love as self-fulfillment. We meet someone, doesn't matter what, what, what sex they are, it doesn't matter anymore, it seems. We meet someone, they make us feel fulfilled, and this is love. Well, it's much better than hating each other, but this love has, a, this idea of love has so obscured things. This love based upon self-fulfillment has actually filled the world with more strife than with peace. Why? When my self-fulfillment conflicts with your self-fulfillment, we have strife, we have disagreement, and we have increasingly anger and hatred in our society. Don't tell me who to marry, what to do, what to do with my personal life. What we need to see is the truly beautiful selfless love that was shown to us on the cross. And when we can show this face of love to the world, we, they can begin to see the difference. They can begin to see what holiness looks like. People need to see what true love, the love that we see upon the cross looks like. They need to see the face of Jesus. And for those in Carmel, Fully living, living the spirituality of Carmel does that. It shows the face of Jesus to the world. We need to, how do we do that? You know, words, sermons, websites, YouTube channels, Facebook pages, they may change the lives of a few. But the masses that we need to reach will not see the face of Jesus until there is a true explosion of grace throughout the world to make countless millions sanctuaries of holiness, sanctuaries of grace. And this is what our Blessed Mother wishes to give us in the flame of love. She says, with this flame full of graces that I give you from my heart, ignite all the hearts in the entire country all the hearts in the entire country. Let this flame go from heart to heart. This is the miracle becoming the blaze whose dazzling light will blind Satan. This is the fire of love of union 
which I obtained from the Heavenly Father through the merits of the wounds of my divine Son. How deeply Carmelite that is. How much that speaks to what we know is our spirituality and need to bring to the whole world. So this gift of the flame of love is not about starting another prayer group or another devotion, although we have them and they're important and they're beautiful, but it's much bigger. It's about bringing this great outpouring of graces to everything we do, to every path of life, and to Carmel to work together. In fact, Carmel has a very, very special place in the flame of love. The flame of love is how we light this path to Carmel in an age of deepening darkness and confusion. It's letting our Blessed Mother get to work to bring the world, to show the world her son. Now, this face of Jesus, this face of holiness, is not always what we see in the church. Even in the church, we have such confusion. Sometimes we come to church and really what we hear is homespun wisdom. We hear modern psychology passing off as Christianity. We hear a health and wealth gospel. You know, come to church, give me your money, and God will give you everything you want. The car, the job, the girl, whatever you're looking for. Or so often our Christianity boils down to, oh, be a nice person like you learned in kindergarten. Go to church on Sunday and get to heaven. And it's so much more. We do not always see the holiness that is the powerful transformation of grace. It is grace that makes Jesus present. And the flame of love is the movement of grace to bring this great outpouring of graces everywhere. And it is so tied to Carmel. First, to begin with, the woman to whom this first came, the woman we'll talk about a little bit, a woman named Elizabeth Kindleman, the most unlikely person in the most unlikely place in a difficult time in communist Hungary in the early 1960s. And it just so happened that she was a secular Carmelite. So Carmel, right from the very beginning, is tied, or fame of love very from the very beginning is tied to Carmel. But there's more than that. Our Blessed Mother has a special role for Carmel in this. She says, my little Carmelite, I invite those living in the house of the Carmelite fathers. They accomplish missionary work throughout the country with great devotion and love, which is very difficult under the communists. Let them be the first to receive the flame of love and spread it. Don't hesitate. Start working as soon as they are the ones who honor me the most, or rather they are the ones most called to honor me. A very special place for the Carmel. In fact, the flame of love would not exist were it not for the actions of an uncanonized secular Carmelite saint that we only know as Brother B. What's interesting about this woman, Elizabeth Kindleman, is how very difficult her life was. Let me tell you a little bit about it because it sets the stage for why the Carmelite community was so important to her. She was born right before World War I breaks out, which was a devastating war for Hungary. No nation really suffered more than Hungary under World War I. It was decimated afterwards. She's born in 1913, the 13th of 13 children. Come to think of it, 13 plays a very important role in her life. All, and she's sent off to live with her maternal grandmother. She's undernourished, she's barely educated, she goes back to Budapest when she's six, but still, it's an impoverished country. Finally, when she's about 10, it's almost a rescue mission. She's sent off to a wealthy family in Switzerland. She gains some weight, some education. But when she's 11, she learns that her mother is sick back home in Budapest, in Hungary. And as she writes in her biography, she says, only for love, I went back to my mother and her mother dies, and she misses the train back to Switzerland. This 11-year-old orphan is on the streets of Budapest, all on her own. 
She doesn't lose faith. In fact, twice she tries to become a nun. And like me, trying to go to Carmel is told, no, there's something else for you. She's just barely eking out a survival on the streets, very creative, carrying bags for people for groceries, just trying to find a way to make do. And her life changes very much when she is 15. And at 16, she has, apparently has a beautiful voice. She's singing in the church choir as the first soprano, falls in love with the first tenor, sounds like a perfect script for a movie. He's actually a much older man, which was not uncommon then, because so many men died in the war. And they marry, have a beautiful family, six children. World War II comes, the communists come, and her husband dies, leaving her with six young children as a devout Catholic in a communist country. She was fired all the time from her jobs. But why? They learned she had a statue of the Blessed Mother. They learned she had blessed candles. They learned she sent her children to faith formation, that was elite, which was illegal. She was starving. She literally sold all the goods of the house. She collected scraps to feed her family. She was working multiple jobs when she could find them. And it almost broke her. It almost broke her. The way the diary begins is, her diary begins is so touching. She says, the Lord continually leads us on his way. It is we who do not always follow. I stopped following. And she talks about the problems of being a widow, the exhausting work, how it ground her down. There was this great battle in her soul. She'd go to mass, but it was empty. She'd yawn and, and, and just, it was empty to her, had lost all meaning. She says, finally, I decided I'm not going anymore just to spend the time yawning. It didn't even bother me anymore that I'm not going to Mass. And I just commenced to do the week's laundry. Her children actually say, Plurry, it's Mass time. And it shook me up. I went to Mass, but I didn't know what to say. Constantly it went through my mind, what a fool I am. Why do I even keep the Carmelite fast? It's an empty compulsion. Just stop doing it all. She's ready to abandon faith. So I decided not to continue abstaining from meat. My diet was so meager anyway. And she says it continued this way until one day when my daughter said to me, Mr. B's funeral is going to be today at 2 p.m. There was one when she told me, this hit me hard. I dressed in a hurry so I wouldn't be late. I arrived at the funeral parlor, sobbing overcame me. I thought to myself, all is well for him now. He was a true Carmelite who lived an exemplary holy life. But will I get there? Don't cry. I heard his meek, kind voice as only the blessed in heaven can speak. Go back to the Carmel. The, the next day was Sunday, July 16th the feast day of Our Lady of Carmel, the titular feast day of my church. I arrived early in the morning and stayed until late in the evening. With great difficulty, I decided to go to confession. Terrible spiritual dryness consumed my soul. I felt no sense of repentance. Just did a, she says she just did her penance mechanically. Thought about all the people and praising God didn't even enter her mind. She says, I just kept thinking about Brother B, her brother Carmelite. Thinking about him brought some relief to my soul. I heard him direct me to the Blessed Virgin. Go and prostrate yourself before her. I went, but in my soul, the words I wanted to say to her did not give me any peace. It was late at night when I got home. But then notice what happens. She says, once inside, such an unusual feeling surprised me, as though I had left my beaten, worn down soul back in the Carmel. I walked out into the garden with a heavy heart, where in the silence of the night, a shower of tears began to fall. Under the starry sky, in front of the statue of Our Lady of Lords that stood in our garden, I began to pray fervently. The next morning, I went to my dear little chapel. I used to go there as a young mother with my little ones. This is where I used to meet with Brother B at the altar of the Lord. 
Now again, it was his devotion that brought me there. From the depths of my heart, I implored, my heavenly mother, don't let go of me. I never want to be unfaithful to you again. Hold me tightly. I don't trust myself. My steps are unsteady. And during the Holy Mass, I continually beseeched, besought the Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me my sins. See how important her Carmelite community was. It was that sense of community that was maintained, that brought her right back from the cliff. She says, the love I felt for the Lord Jesus and the feeling of sorrow for my sins created a veil of tears over my eyes. I didn't want to look at the world anymore. I sought only after silence so I could continuously hear the Lord's words. Then I raised up within myself faith, hope, and love and asked him to never let me be torn from him again, to chain me to his sacred feet tightly and closely that I may remain next to him alone because this way I'll be safe. I diligently tried with all my strength to do this. After this, everything happened in such a way that I drifted closer and closer to him, but he kept urging me, I'd like to give you great graces, but then renounce yourself completely. These were difficult words for me to understand. Therefore, I asked him, will I be capable of doing this? And Jesus says, just want it. Leave the rest to me. So this was how we begin. We wouldn't have the flame of love were it not for Carmel. She wouldn't have made it were it not for being faithful to her Carmelite community. And hopefully those of you in Carmel, it reinforces how important this is, how important you are to each other. But there's more. How often in the flame of love, Jesus comes back to the spirituality of Carmel to illustrate what we need to do in the world today. He says to her, do you know how to be a good Carmelite? Live humbly, live the hidden contemplative life in union with me. Reframe your tongue and be on guard not to say unneeded words. My love for you knows no limits, my little Carmelite. Do you know how happy I am when you accept the sacrifices I offer you? Persevere with me, by this you make me happy. Desire many souls for me so I can distribute my graces to them. Remember what I told you. Whatever you ask, you will receive. Pray and do much penance. This is the goal of the life of a true Carmelite. And she says, help me, Lord, to renounce my own will, to obey only you, and to seek only what pleases you. How beautiful the spirituality is that comes across. But it continues. Our Blessed Mother also speaks about Carmel and the flame of love. She says to this woman, I assure you, my little one, that I have never before given into your hands such a powerful force of grace, the burning flame of the love of my heart. Ever since the word became flesh, I have not undertaken a greater movement than the flame of love of my heart who rushes to you. Until now, nothing could blind Satan as much. It is up to you not to reject it, for this rejection would simply spell disaster. And Elizabeth says, my heavenly mother, you're entrusting me with this great cause, me the most miserable in the world, me a beggar clothed in rags. I'm not worthy in human terms and much less in your sight. And this is when she says to her, my flame of love will first flare up at the Carmel, my little one, for is there any place where I am more venerated they are the ones called to venerate me the most. They must collaborate in spreading the flame of love. Hurry, my little one. The moment is near when my flame of love will ignite. At that moment, Satan will be blinded. The flame will ignite and reach the whole world, not only in the nations consecrated to me, but over all the earth. It will spread out even to the most inaccessible places for there is no place inaccessible to Satan. From it draw strength and confidence. I will support you. 
This is what our Blessed Mother has in mind. To finally, once and for all, break the influence of Satan over the entire world. This isn't about a new prayer group in church. This isn't about a new devotion. This is about how do we once and for all free the world from the influence, the blinding, deafening influence of Satan. We look at the world about us and what do we do? They are so deceived, so lost. How many of us are getting a little tired of watching our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren born out of wedlock, if they're allowed to be born at all? Aren't we getting a little tired of turning to our, our children or our grandchildren and saying, please don't move in with your boyfriend or your girlfriend again? And they look at us like we have 10 heads. We invite people to church. They look like us, we've got 15 heads. What's wrong? The faith makes sense. The faith is logical. The gospel is beautiful. Who would not want to know that God loves them so much to become incarnate and sacrifice himself on the cross? Why don't they hear? Why can't they listen? Because someone has blinded them and deafened them so much they can't see beauty for what beauty is. And this is for all of us now. We need to show the beautiful face of Christ to the world. Blind Satan so that they can see. And so I pray that the flame of love comes to Carmel and Carmel embraces it to strengthen our commitment for all that we have been entrusted with to show Jesus' face to the world. We see an example of this commitment and this need for Carmel. There's an interesting situation where Elizabeth is at lunch and a magazine fell into her hands. She began to read an article, and the Lord silently made his voice heard. What an interesting phrase. Right? He silently made his voice heard. Jesus said, put it away. Did you forget that I wanted you to renounce all distracting literature? Let your life be one of contemplation, prayer, and sacrifice. It would hurt me if you did not want to be a true Carmelite. Is renunciation difficult? Don't worry, I'll repay you. So again, this constant reference to Carmel and the flame of love. Our Blessed Mother says, keep vigil over the silence of your soul, my little Carmelite. Give no entrance even to a whisper that might disturb the silence of your soul. Our words will continue to echo if you listen with humility and holy devotion. But where does all of this come out? What is our Blessed Mother doing this and wanting to do with Carmel and wanting to do with the flame of love? It all comes out to a profound union with our God, not for ourselves, but for the salvation of souls. To work in union with Jesus, in union with our Blessed Mother, for the salvation of souls. That's what all of this is about. To become so completely united to Jesus as the effect of grace that there is no room left for Satan, no room left for his influence, that we drive him out by the presence of Jesus, made present as the effect of grace. That is what this is about. And it's for all of us to do. But why now? Why now? Why is Carmel called to this now? Why are all of us called to this now? To help our Blessed Mother spread the flame of love of her Immaculate Heart. Well, when our Blessed Mother and our Lord gave the flame of love as his gift to the Church, they warned us that we would be under attack. And think of the timing of this. This is in Communist Hungary, in the early 1960s. What's the time setting? For one, we've ignored Fatima. And our Blessed Mother warned us, didn't she? That if we ignored Fatima, if we ignored what she said, that indeed Russia would spread her errors throughout the world. And no place suffered more than Eastern Europe where this is happening. In fact, they had just gone through the 56 uprising, trying to overthrow the communists. It was brutally suppressed. And it's just after this that the flame of love comes. 
What else is happening in the early 1960s? It's the beginning of the sexual revolution. We're starting to plant the seeds that we're reaping so painfully today. It is now because we are under attack. We can't wait any longer. We can't continue to be a mediocre Christianity. We can't afford to be a church that ignores grace and its great power over us. We cannot afford business as usual, because business as usual is giving place to Satan in the world. It is time for something new and powerful to strengthen everything we do by grace. This is what it's about. This is what it's about. We need to light the way to Carmel for all the world, and we can only do that by grace. So what are we to do? What are we to do to help our Blessed Mother do this? Well, she tells us what to do. And again, it's rooted so deeply in the spirituality of Carmel. She tells us that our role in bringing this great light to the world, our role in bringing this grace is one part, and then the rest is for her to do. And she gives us the importance of responding to grace as grace needs to be responded to by sacrificial love, by living the love of the cross, by embracing it and living it throughout our lives. This is what the flame of love is about. And so she tells us there's a, there's a time when Elizabeth is trying to speak to a priest about the flame of love. And she's struggling mightily to do this. And she's fumbling over her words. She can't get them out. She's so discouraged. And her blessed mother comes the next day to her and says, why did you try so hard? Why did you try so hard? Remember what your role is. Your role is suffering and sacrifice to embrace all of this in love for others. But who and how they are to understand the flame of love is not your business. I'm the one who lights the flame of love in hearts. I'm the one who does this. So how do we work with our Blessed Mother in this? It is by embracing the response to grace. In the flame of love, we again have a great connection to Carmel because of the goal that we have in mind. That in the flame of love, our Blessed Mother wishes to target everyone on earth, everyone on earth, to bring about the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. And again, this is so tied to Carmel. What was the very last thing that Lucia saw in the sun at Fatima? Who was it? It was Our Lady of Mount Carmel, wasn't it? Again, another connection. So let's talk about for whom this flame of love is intended and how big this is and how big a change this is for the world. When the flame of love comes, it comes on April 13th, 1962. That should ring a bell right away because what else happens on, April, on the 13th of the month? Fatima. All the Fatima apparitions are on the 13th of the month. And indeed, the final vision of Sister Lucia in 1929 was on the 13th of the month. And so it is, it comes on the 13th of the month. Mary comes to this woman and she says, let us save the country. This gives us the scope. This isn't Jesus coming to St. Francis and saying, build my church. This is Elizabeth saying, let us save the country. Now let's think about who that is. In Hungary, there's a large Catholic population. It's also a large Protestant population. It's under communism, there's a large atheist population. You notice she doesn't make any distinction between them. Let us save the country. I place a beam of light in your hand. It is the flame of love of my heart. Add your love to this flame and pass it on to others, my little one. 
This is what comes. And it's interesting that she makes this, this point about adding our love to it, lighting our flames. When explaining for whom the flame of love is for, Jesus makes reference to the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. We just covered this at the end of the liturgical year, right? We have the wise virgins, they have oil in their lamp, their lights, lamps are lit. And we have the foolish ones with no oil, their lamps have gone out. And using this parable, Jesus explains who is to receive this flame of love. And we don't want to underestimate this. This is not just about another movement in the church. What Jesus says to her is he says, these drops of oil squeezed by your sufferings. Let me explain that for a moment. He calls her his little sunflower, and he makes the analogy of squeezing oil out of seeds by her willingness to sacrifice in her life, to live a life of love, as if he's squeezing the oil out of her seeds. What happens when you squeeze the oil out of seeds and put them into an empty lamp? The lamp can light. And this is what Jesus says. He says, these drops of oil squeezed by your sufferings will fall in the empty lamps of souls. That's who this is meant for. Those who have lost faith, those where faith has died. Anyone have anyone they know who has lost faith? Like everyone? And how much this wounds us, how much this hurts us. What do we do about them? Sometimes it seems the more we try to approach them, the further away they go, the more we drive them away. That's for whom the flame of love is intended, those whose lamps have gone out. And what will happen? He says, this drop of oil squeezed by your suffering will fall in the empty lamps of souls, and the fire will be lit in them by the flame of love of my mother. By its light, they will find the road that leads to me. This is what we need to have happen in our world to bring our children back, to bring those who have abandoned faith back. You know, it really kills me that I realize the largest Christian denomination in the U.S. are Catholics. Second largest group are former Catholics. Or we might say Catholics who have stopped practicing their faith. Catholics whose lamps have gone out. How do we light them? This way, with our Blessed Mother stepping in with her flame of love. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says, this drop of oil squeezed out by your sufferings when united to my merits will fall on those souls who still do not have a lamp. Those who have never had a faith, have never been baptized. We begin to see how large this is, how big this is. This isn't about 15 people getting together in a prayer group. This isn't about 100,000 people in a movement around the world. This isn't about a church of one and a half billion people. This is about all eight billion souls on earth. How do we bring them to her son? Jesus says, this drop of oil squeezed out by your sufferings when united to my merits will fall on those souls who still do not have a lamp. They'll be astounded and will seek its cause and they will find the road that leads to salvation. We're not talking about a website or a preaching or, or, or a Facebook page. We're talking about a miracle that our Blessed Mother wants to do to light her love in other hearts. As I said, so many of us have loved ones who have left the church, loved ones who have no faith, grandchildren who have never been baptized. And what do we wish for them? Don't we sometimes wish we could just take what's in our heart out of our chest and just put it right into their chest? If only they could feel what we feel. If only they could see what we see. If only they could understand what we understand. If only they could know and sense how much God loves them. If only we could take what's in our heart and put it right in theirs. That's what our Blessed Mother wants to do. There is no heart that loves her son more than hers. And she wishes to share that love with them. And when this lights in hearts, we don't even have a faith. Something miraculously happens. We can't change this world by websites and, and preaching and, and, and Facebook pages. We can do our best, we shouldn't stop trying. We need a miracle. 
We need a miracle. We need a miracle such that when our Blessed Mother puts her love in these hearts, they don't know what has hit them. And we have people who will say, God, why am I thinking about God? I don't even believe he exists. Why am I thinking about God? Why am I being drawn to this Catholic Church? Aren't they the enemy? We make movies about them, about how nasty they are. Why am I being drawn this way? Why? Because our Blessed Mother is at work to draw them to her son, as she always wishes to do. This is her goal. This is what this is about. It is for all of these souls. Let's look at some of the other examples that our Blessed Mother tells us. Who is supposed to receive the flame of love of her heart? She says, my flame of love, with its unimaginable light and beneficent warmth, will wrap the earth. To accomplish this, my little one, I need sacrifice, your sacrifice, and the sacrifice of many, such that the minds and hearts where the infernal hatred is burning. Do we catch that? This is for places, hearts, that are burning with infernal hatred. What we saw in Gaza is infernal hatred. What we have seen in Ukraine is infernal hatred. What we see playing out in our own country with his violence is infernal hatred. Such that those where the minds and hearts where the infernal hatred is burning may receive the soft light of my flame of love. Jesus says, to participate in my work of salvation, you must attract those souls who despise me and do not understand me. That's who this is for. That's who this is for. That's how big this is. Let's stop for a moment. If we see the flame of love is supposed to be for those with lit lamps, those with extinguished lamps, and those with no lamps. Oh, wait a minute. Who is that? That's everyone. That's everyone. Lit lamps, extinguished lamps, no lamps, everyone. What do we call it when by the love of our Blessed Mother's heart, all people are drawn to her son? What do we call that? That's the triumph of her immaculate heart. That's what this is about. And Carmel is an important part of that, or it wouldn't have been Our Lady of Mount Carmel appearing at the end of Fatima. At Fatima, we were told what would happen. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. And so we wait for that day. It seems almost, will it ever come? Will there be a day when the water, when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea? Will there be a day when we lay down our arms and we beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks? Will there be a day when peace finally breaks out? Will there be a day when all people finally come to love our Lord? Yes, yes, there will be. What do we read in our antiphon today? The Lord will come. There's no need to fear. It will come. At Fatima, our Blessed Mother told us what would happen. In the flame of love, she tells us how. And surprise, surprise, it's through her son, through grace, the way it has always been, but we have not been paying attention. This is a deep connection again between Carmel and the flame of love. How we must work with our Blessed Mother to bring all people to her Son. So I say this is not about starting another prayer devotion. This is not about starting another prayer group. It's not about a bunch of messages or a messenger. It's not about our personal spirituality. Although you speak to anyone who is in the flame of love and they'll tell you what a difference it has made in their lives. That's important, that's good. We have a group right here you can talk to afterwards to get their own personal testimony of what it has done for them. But that's not the goal. It's not about our personal spirituality. It's not just about renewing the church. This is how we work with our Blessed Mother to bring all people to her son miraculously. When someone receives the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, they're not receiving prayers or knowledge, practices. No, they're receiving something substantial, something miraculously life-changing. They're receiving 
the very love of our Blessed Mother's own heart, full of grace. Again, let's listen to how our Blessed Mother describes this. She says, my little one, my flame of love has become so incandescent that I want to spread on you not only its light, but also its warmth with all its power. My flame of love is so great that I can no longer keep it within me. It leaps out at you with explosive force. My love, she says, my love that is spreading will overcome the satanic hatred that contaminates the world. What do you do with a situation like Gaza on all sides? What do you do with the situations we see in the world that seem so intractable, hatred so deeply entrenched? Yes, my love that is spreading will overcome the satanic hatred that contaminates the world so that the greatest number of souls is saved from damnation. I'm confirming there has never been anything like this before. This is my greatest miracle ever I am accomplishing for all. Not for the church, not for a small group, for all, all. Again, when the flame of love comes, she says, let us save the country by giving us her love, right? I'm putting a beam of light in your hands. It is the flame of love of my heart. Add your love to this flame and pass it on to others. Is anyone familiar with Father Michael Gately's 33 Days to Consecration, of oh, Morning Glory? Beautiful consecration program. And he has a beautiful prayer that draws upon the spirituality of St. Louis de Montfort, St. Mother Teresa, Pope St. John Paul II, Maximilian Kolbe. And the way it opens is so beautiful. There's a line where in consecration to our Blessed Mother, we say, we pray, keep my heart in your most pure heart, that I may love Jesus and all the members of his body with your own perfect love. That's what the flame of love is, to have this love of our Blessed Mother alive in our hearts, this love of a heart that is full of grace. That's, that's a special title. Every time we pray our Hail Mary, what do we say? Hail Mary, full of grace. What does that mean? You know, there are only two people in the whole Bible who are called full of grace. One is Mary. Anyone know who the other one is? It's Jesus, full of grace and truth. This is a special state to be full of grace. There is no created being who can love as much as Mary. And she is willing to put this love in our hearts. That's what we receive. That's what this is about. And that love is so intense. Being full of grace is so united to Jesus that this flame of love is Jesus himself. You know, Mary's love doesn't, doesn't come from herself. Even though immaculately conceived, this love does not come from herself. Even her immaculate conception was a great event of grace. And all that our Blessed Mother has, she has from our Lord. She has from God. And she is so full, so completely united with our Lord that this love in her heart is our Lord himself. A love that binds us right to the very Trinity. It is this love that we need to light with others. But how? How? In the flame of love, there are really six levels of this participation in the flame of love that we want to spread to the whole world. And I'll give them to you in decreasing order of importance and scope. Most importantly, the first level of participating in this great miracle of our Blessed Mother is just to receive the flame of love she offers. No preconditions, no requirements. Like any grace, it is a gift. Just to receive 
the flame of love of her immaculate heart. This is for everyone in the world. Remember Jesus saying it would lighten the hearts of those who have, whose lamps have gone out. It would lighten the hearts of those who have no lamps at all. It's our Blessed Mother's miracle for all people. This is for everyone to receive this. But like any grace, it needs a response. That's the second level. Once we receive this great love, we need to respond to this great love. The third level of participation is in the flame of love. There, there are only three devotional elements of the flame of love, but they are powerful, they are profound, they are deeply graced, and they work together to bring us back to the gospel. And so the third level is to take these devotional elements and incorporate them into our personal lives. What are those? I'll cover those briefly, because again, they are they show again the genius of what our Blessed Mother is doing in her flame of love. There are only three things that she asks for that we do. One was to meditate on the five wounds of Jesus. Father made reference to that in, in, his, in his prayer. But she's very specific about this. That's not new to the church, right? St. Clair of Assisi would meditate on the five wounds, the Palatines. But she was very specific. One, she said to meditate, it's not a prayer. She said to meditate, think on the five wounds. But she said specifically to offer ourselves to the Heavenly Father through the wounds of Jesus. In other words, the only way that we can offer ourselves to the Father, the only way that we can be acceptable to the Father is to love the way that Jesus showed us on the cross. We must love with the love of the cross. That's the love we have to show to the world. That's the love we have to live. But there's a problem with that. We can't do that, at least not consistently, not on our own. We fall back in our human weakness into living for ourselves instead of pouring out our lives for others. So we need a miracle, and we call that miracle grace. That grace that changes our very nature from our human nature into the divine nature, as St. Peter will tell us. That grace that makes us holy, that grace that makes it possible for us to think and to feel and to act and to be as God is. That's what we're called to. And so in the flame of love, our Blessed Mother gave us the flame of love, Hail Mary. And this has confused a number of people because erroneously we have sometimes explained, explained this as a change to the Hail Mary, which it is not. It is its own prayer, emphasizing the importance of grace. Grace is so important at this time. The only way out of the mess that we see in the world is grace. It is our only hope, and it's our every hope. It is the way to end this mess. It is the way to drive Satan out of the world is by making Jesus present by grace. This is so important at this time and age that to emphasize it, our Blessed Mother took a prayer we all know, the Hail Mary, so well. And to it she added this petition for grace, asking her, pleading with her to spread the effect of grace of her flame of love over all of humanity not just for us, over all humanity, lit lamps, extinguished lamps, no lamps, every person on earth, that's the way they will come to her son. That's the flame of love, Hail Mary, a plea for grace to change the world, because that's the only way we can love that way. And what is the ultimate effect of grace? The ultimate effect of grace is to make us completely united to Jesus. That's just not a figure of speech. The only way that we come to salvation is being by literally part of the body of Jesus. Right? He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He says, I am the way. I am the life. I am the vine. Unless you're in me, you have no life. St. John tells us we've been given eternal life. This life is in his Son. 
Grace ultimately brings us into complete union with Jesus. Again, sound like Carmel? Complete union with Jesus by grace, as the effect of grace. So what do we have? Jesus himself gave us this beautiful unity prayer where he expresses his deepest desire for us. It's his prayer to us that we get to echo back to him. He says, my deepest desire is, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. This is what he wants for us. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal Father. He wants to be part of all of our body, our feet, our hands, our heart. That soul is actually talking about our intestines, where we feel our deepest feelings in the Hungarian. You know, our brains, our eyes, our ears, our lips, all working together with Jesus in union with him. In fact, let me digress on that for just a moment, because that prayer is beautiful. I think many of you may know it, but it's also easy to misunderstand. When Jesus says, let our feet journey together, it's easy to misunderstand this as a me and Jesus player. You know, Jesus, yes, I do want you to come with me. Jesus, come with me to work. Jesus, come with me to the store. Jesus, come with me to the beach. Jesus, come with me to my happy place. Jesus, come into my life. Well, that's good. That's not what the unity prayer is talking about. When Jesus explains the unity prayer, he says, yes, let our feet journey together, not to our happy place. He says, our feet have to journey together to Calvary. That's where we're going, to Calvary. Our hands are to gather souls because this is what he wants most of all. He says, let our hearts beat in unity, in unison. He says, do you know what that means? It means my human heart beats in rhythm with my divinity. Your heart beats with my heart. That means you partake of my divinity. You must become saints. We must become holy. When he says, let our deepest feelings be the same, let our souls be in harmony, it's really let the place where we feel our deepest feelings feel the same. He says, my deepest feeling, my deepest longing is for souls. When he says, let our minds, thoughts be one, he says, my every thought is for souls. When he says, let our lips pray together for mercy from the eternal Father, it's not mercy for us, it's mercy for others seeking souls. In the unity prayer, we're not inviting Jesus into our life. Jesus is inviting us into his life, into that life. We have to go to Calvary. What happens when we are completely united to Jesus and he completely fills our life? What happens? There's no room left for Satan. He's driven out. And when he's driven out, what happens to souls? They're saved. Do you see how together this gives us the gospel? This gives us the gospel. For most of us as, as Catholics, we really, do we know what the gospel is? You know, an atheist comes up to us and says, I'm an atheist, you're a Catholic, tell me what the gospel is. Uh, uh, call Father Robert. Every time we pray the flame of love, we're reminded what the gospel is. We're called to love as God loves. That's the only love worthy of heaven. We're called to love as God loves. We meditate on the five wounds, offering ourselves to the Father. We can't do that except by the miracle of grace, the flame of love, Hail Mary. And when grace has its full effect, Jesus is made present in our lives by the unity prayer. Satan is driven out. Souls are saved. So that's why that next level of participation is to take these prayers. They were so important to Jesus and Mary, they put great graces with them. The power to blind Satan, to free souls from purgatory. Tremendous promises associated with these. So bring these devotional elements into your life. The next level of participation. So first is to receive. That's for everyone in the world. Next is to respond. That's for everyone in the world. Next is for those who know. 
incorporate this, this rehearsal of the gospel, these beautiful and powerful devotional elements. And the fourth is to take the flame of love itself and these devotional elements home. Take them home. The flame of love is for children, for our families. When the flame of love is given, our Blessed Mother asks for family holy hours. She says our families have grown cold and separated. Our children live as if there's no immortal soul. That families are divided and destroyed and she wants to warm them again, bring them alive again with love. Family holy hours. I tell our parents, you can't protect your children anymore. If all you're trying to do is protect your children, you will lose that fight. There's too much thrown at them. To try to just protect them is to fight a defensive war. You can't win a defensive war. We need to teach our children to be active participants in the life of grace. We need to teach our children to be the ones that drive out evil when it confronts them. We need to be the ones, the children need to be the ones when they see something at their, their friend's house, they know that's wrong. They drive out the evil. When it pops up on their cell phones or their computers, they drive out the evil. When they're taught something that is just wrong at school, they stand up against evil. Our children must be participants in grace. They need the very love of our Blessed Mother in their hearts too. So they love our Lord. So it becomes their religion, not just their parents because our Blessed Mother's love is alive in their hearts and they are participants in grace. Bring it home. Bring it home. Then, the next smaller group of people is for those who feel the call and have the time to come and pray in community. Again, the importance of community. So we come together, and this is where we have our Flame of Love prayer groups and cynicals, and they're open, of course, to everyone. So that together we come together to blind Satan and drive out his influence. Now, this blinding Satan may sound strange. It may sound like it's some fringe movement of the church. No, it's right at the heart of the church. St. John tells us, 1 John 3, 8, that the Son of God was manifested, why? To destroy the works of the evil one. We're told by the writer of Hebrews, why did Jesus take flesh? So that he could die. And that by death destroy the power of him who had the power of death, who held us captive through fear of death. Driving out and destroying the influence of Satan was why Jesus came, to bring us to him and to break the influence of evil and to end it. So when we come together, and pray in community, we're so much stronger than when we were apart. And we do this to drive Satan out of our parishes, out of our communities, to take our communities back from the influence of Satan. And then finally, for those who are so-called, like myself or Yvonne or others here, you are to work in the apostolate of the flame of love. But that's the smallest group. I want to come back to what is the most important. Again, this is not about us enhancing our own spirituality. This is about us working with our Blessed Mother to draw all people to her Son at last, to once and for all end this madness. So let's come back to this idea of receiving and responding. Again, this is for all, just simply to receive. But now the challenge becomes the response. The response is going to be different based upon where we are in the flame of love. As we learn from Jesus' words, when those who have extinguished lamps, those who have no lamps, have the flame of love light in their heart, what happens? It lights the way to salvation. It lights the way to Jesus. What is the response? They've got to follow the way. They've got to follow that light. If they don't, it's useless. But what about us? And this will come back to how we work with our Blessed Mother to spread this. What about us? What is the response to grace? The response to grace is sacrificial love. It's the love of the cross. 
Sacrificial love is the response to grace. If the flame of love is the greatest outpouring of graces since the word was made flesh, what can we expect in response? The greatest outpouring of the sacrificial love. And that love is what will show the world the beauty of holiness. This is what it is. This is what we're called to. This is the response. And how does that response take shape? Again, this comes down to understanding what love is. That this love is this pouring out of ourselves for others. Again, that's what St. John tells us. He tells us this is how we know love. That he poured out his life for us. And we must pour out our lives for our brothers. So, what is this response to grace? It is not just prayer. It is not just prayer. It may sound strange to say, but prayer alone is not enough. Why is that? It's interesting. In the flame of love, Jesus and Mary constantly put two words together. Prayer, it's important, prayer and sacrifice. Prayer and sacrifice. In a beautiful passage regarding the hatred that's in the world, our Blessed Mother says this. She says, do you know what you represent? You are a sparkle of light enkindled in my flame of love. The light you receive from me enlightens souls. That's what we need to do. Light the way to Carmel. How do they, re- how do they climb this mount? How do they ascend the mount? It enlightens souls. The greater the number of souls who sacrifice and watch in prayer, the greater the power of my flame of love on earth will be. Hence, line up in close ranks because it is with the power of sacrifice and prayer that the flash of hellish hatred will be overcome. Evil will diminish gradually. The burning flame of hatred will be put out. It will happen. The burning flame of hatred will be put out, and the splendor of my flame of love will fill all regions of the earth. She says again at another time, sacrifice and prayer. These are your instruments. The goal is to bring about the powerful work of salvation. Now, if we've been praying and praying and praying, and it doesn't seem to be making any difference, it doesn't seem to be changing the world, maybe it's because we're only breathing with one lung. It's not just prayer. It's not just prayer. In fact, in a scathing statement, because Jesus is concerned about us falling into this trap of thinking all we have to do is say our prayers. No. It's not enough to say our prayers. We have to live our prayers. It's not enough to say our prayers. We have to live our prayers. Listen to what Jesus says to this woman about this problem. He says, write down my words, or better, my request to those who are indifferent. There is no progress without sacrifice. I'm not happy with a sterile piety. It is like a tree that produces no fruit. I'll add this, my Elizabeth, the pious people, not the pagans, not the atheists, not the Satanists, not the people who stop going to church, the pious people who are like this do not even think at what point their soul is gray and dark. The light of grace only penetrates and illumines the soul burning with love to the degree that they expose their soul to the transforming effect of my grace. Do not be surprised that I speak in a severe tone of voice. This severity springs also from my love. Why? Because if we're stuck in this trap, we're not ready for heaven. Jesus wants to break us out of this trap out of his love. He says, I would like them to take at heart my words. 
and that they prostrate themselves before me in an atoning adoration and repentant heart. For it is also a habit of pious souls, a habit of pious souls, to think that after having spent a good time at their devotions, they have already given to God what is God's. Oh, you fools! That's a pretty strong statement for pious people. Yes, it's a habit of pious souls to think that after having spent a good time at their devotions, they have already given to God what is God's. Oh, you fools! If you could only feel the immense pain your pious indifference causes to my divine heart, I am the victim. And it was not by pious attitudes, but only by a continual acceptance of sacrifices that I brought about my redemptive work. Repent! 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 I think he means it, and we need to take it seriously. But why? Why is he so adamant about this? Why is he so harsh about this out of his love? Because this is how grace works. This is how grace works. This is very practical. You don't need a theology degree for this. It's very practical. One of my many favorite hymns is Open My Eyes. Love it for a Lenten hymn. If anyone's familiar with Open My Eyes. I love the third verse. In the third verse, we, we cry out, Open my heart, Lord. Help me to love like you. Now stop right there. If we ask Jesus, and we pray to Jesus that he helps us love like him. What will the answer to that prayer look like? He will give us the opportunity to love like him, won't he? How does he love? On the cross. Sounds like Abbott and Costello, right? Third base. Now, how does he love? On the cross, all the time. This is his love. If we want to love like Jesus, if we pray, help me love like you, what's he going to do? He's going to give us the opportunity to do so. He's going to give us the opportunity to live the cross. This is why sometimes as we grow in our Christianity, our lives don't get easier. They get harder. Sometimes we're mystified by that. We think, didn't he say my yoke is easy, my burden is light? What gives here, Jesus? Why is it getting harder? Because as we grow more and more, he gives us more and more opportunity to love like he loves. The more we love like Jesus, the closer we grow to the cross. Sounds a little like Carmel, doesn't it? So we have to understand a little bit about love, because if we get that wrong, as I say, we get everything wrong. I started by talking about the need to see Jesus because we're so blinded by this concept of love as self-fulfillment. That love just doesn't work. It's so different from the love of God. Looking at my, my time here to see what we've got here, but I think I'll take the time to ex explain this, that we meet someone, right? And we fall in love with them. And it's good, much better than, you know, hating, them, hating everybody on earth. But we say, I love you. And why do I love you? I love you because of all the things you are. Because of, you're so wonderful, you're so kind, you're so gentle, you're so wise. You make me feel so fulfilled when I'm with you. I'd be lost without you. And we think that's love, right? It's good. Is it selfish? It's all about what do I get from you? And the problem with that love is what happens when I no longer get it from you? The love stops. When Jesus ten, turns to us and says, I love you, and why do I love you? It's not because of all the things that you are, filthy sinner who nailed me to a cross. It's because of all the things I am. Because I am love. 
I will always love you. I loved you when I made you. I loved you when you were born. I loved you when you sinned. I loved you when you repented. I loved you when you sinned again. And I loved you when you repented again. And I will always love you. That kind of love is the love of heaven. That is the love that sacrifices for others. That's the love that loves even when it hurts. But we also need to know about sacrifices. What do we mean by sacrifice? Sacrifice is not we all go out and buy a hair shirt and a cellist and beat ourselves until we're bleeding. That's not what we're talking about. The sacrifice we're talking about is every time we make those choices for love rather than self. There are really only two ends in life. Everything we do, we do either for love or we're doing for living for self. Everything we do towards ourselves, for ourselves, or we do it in love. What does Mary's love in our heart draw us to? What does grace draw us to? True love. Always choosing for other. What does that look like? It's not just theory. So, we're in the kitchen, and we pick up a bunch of bananas. What do we typically do? Eh, that one's bruised, and that one's overripe. I think I'll take this one over here. That's the better one. Who are we living for? Self. What does love do? Love says, you know what? Let me take that ratty one so no one else has to take it, and I'll save the good ones for others. Love goes to the dessert platter and it takes the smallest piece of pie. Unless your husband's on a diet, in which case you take the big one and save the small one for him. But the Christian life is a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie. If we don't want a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie, we don't want to be Christians. These are the sacrifices we're talking about. These small, everyday things that fill the world with love. In fact, Jesus again encourages Elizabeth in this. He talks about the sacrifices we need to make. He says, make your sacrifices without getting discouraged because they are needed to gain the goal. Do not be dejected, seek what is above. Look to me with confidence and seek abundant graces. Be a burning sacrifice among your family. You must especially make the small, insignificant sacrifices. Come to me as I am suffering in total abandonment. Do not be upset that you can only do small things. Just continue to be the little one. We have to fill the world with a billion acts of love. That's what this is for. And if we don't, grace becomes useless. Jesus says to her, I'm the one who increases your suffering with my love. We don't usually put those together, do we? We think suffering is God's punishing us. Here he says, I'm the one who increases your suffering with my love. Why? Because he's giving us the opportunity to learn love. This kind of love you don't learn by knowledge in your head. We learn it by the experience of our bodies, by choosing the ratty banana and the smallest piece of pie. But he says, I'm the one who increases your suffering with my love, while with your constant sacrifices you feed the love I pour over you. Why? Again, it's the way that grace works. Again, for the time's sake, I won't go through these quotes of, of the diary, but basically Jesus says to her, why are you able to live such grace? It's because you prepared your life by so much sacrifice that now I can put everything into your soul. Why? Because she love became a habit for her. Love became something she did all the time. So Jesus could always give her the opportunity to love. And if we don't respond, we lose the grace. He says to her, if you had not prepared this deep channel by your sacrifices, the purifying water of my graces would have drained off. He says, oh, how many, many souls receive my abundant graces, but they're not prepared. And the purifying water of my love drains out. Their souls lose this grace. This is how sacrifices feed love and grace. 
It's the response to grace. We don't respond, we lose the grace. So now this comes back to what are we to do to light this flame of love in all hearts? Remember I mentioned this encounter she had with a priest. And when she struggles, our Blessed Mother reminds her, what is her part? Her part is this life of sacrifices. Her part is to live this every moment of her life. And then our Blessed Mother gets to work. And in response to our willingness to pray, to sacrifice, to desire for people to receive this flame and to labor, she will light the flame. We see this throughout the diary. The flame of love doesn't come by any magic process. It doesn't come just by a ceremony. There is a ceremony outlined, but it comes to people on their deathbed because of our prayers and our sacrifices. It comes to people we don't even know. It comes to people we desire for it to receive. So in spreading the flame of love, it is not just the people in the pews next to us. It is praying and sacrificing for the people on the train with us or on the bus, the people at work, the neighbor who gives us a hard time down the block. It is to desire and sacrifice for all people. Are we willing to live that for our enemies? Well, you know what? If we're not, we're not ready for heaven. Until we're ready to live a life of sacrifice so that our deepest enemies, our worst enemies, can be lit by the flame of love and come to Jesus, that's what we need to do. How we put out the fire of hatred in the world by love filling every corner of our life. Our Blessed Mother said this would be her greatest miracle ever. That's a pretty strong statement. Fatima was pretty big. Guadalupe was pretty big. How can this be bigger? Because this is not a miracle that's to be in one place. Our Blessed Mother said that explicitly. She didn't want to do a great miracle and build a great shrine in one place. She didn't want to do a miracle in the sun or in the tilma or in the healing waters. She wanted to do a miracle in the depth of hearts. A miracle so big that one place cannot hold it. What is that miracle? It's when all of you, all of us, all people inflamed by her flame of love experience this miracle in our hearts where now we're called to this love and we respond to this love and it's filling the world with a billion little tiny acts of love. That's the light that drives out Satan. That's the grace that drives him out. Every time we participate in this life of grace, every time we make that choice for the ratty banana, we're part of this miracle. A miracle that needs to fill the earth with a billion little acts of love. That's the great miracle. That's what we're called to do. And that's the beauty of the diary of this woman to whom the flame of love was given, Elizabeth Kindleman. It's interesting that Jesus told her why he called her. She wanted to be a nun. And he said, nope, I put you in a family setting because I wanted people to see how they should live because you're living proof that we can have holiness in everyday family life. You read her diary and she's feeding the chickens, she's, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's waiting at the drugstore for drugs for, for, for a prescription for her grandchild. Everyday life, but filled completely with love because every choice she made was for other. Think of how most of us live our lives. Most of us live our lives choosing for ourselves, right? We think, how can I spend my money? I spend my money, well, I want to get the most for the least, even if it means resurrecting slavery in the world. How do we spend our time? Well, what we want to do. How do we choose what to wear? What I want to wear. How do we choose what to eat? What I want to eat. See how subtly we live our lives for self. Christianity turns that right around. It says, you know, when I choose what to wear, how do I serve others? When I choose how to spend my money, how do I bless others? Even when I choose what to eat, how to use my time, 
How do I use it for souls? That's what Jesus wants. Do we love him enough to want what he wants? Would we want to do what we want and when it's convenient, we'll do what Jesus wants? His every thought, his every hope, his every feeling is for souls. Are we willing to fill our lives with love? That's what the diary teaches us. I think we have diaries here tonight, if anyone would like them, to learn about this woman, to learn about the life. The diary is not a checklist of what to do for the flame of love. In fact, I love the line where Jesus tells her, don't ask me what to do. Be creative. Find ways to love. Now, sometimes people will come and say, what do I have to do for flame of love? Or what do I have to do for anything? What do I have to do for Carmel? And I tell people, that's not a Christian question. There are two problems with that question. One, it's incomplete. The real question is, what do I have to do in order to typically get what I want from God? And the other is, it's not a Christian question. Christians don't ask, what do I have to do? Christians ask, what can I do? The whole idea is, how can we take love? How far can we go with love? And this is what the diary teaches us. In this diary, two things happen when people read the diary. First thing they notice is how intimate Jesus and Elizabeth are. But the next thing they say is, ah, oh, all that suffering. Why is Jesus being so hard on this woman? Her life is hard enough. can he give her a break? Why all this sacrifice? Why is Jesus being so hard on Elizabeth? And the answer is he's not being hard on Elizabeth. He's opening her eyes to see how far she can take love, to see how much she can love. In her example, she's, re well, she's reading a magazine. Jesus has put it down. You can use this time to save souls. And we think, ah, oh, Jesus, really? Why are you being so hard on her? It's because he's showing her, you know, every moment is useful. Every moment can be given in love. And that's what the diary teaches us. So I encourage you to take it and read it, no matter what you like to do, and you'll find it very Carmelite. You'll find it is about giving ourselves completely in union with our Lord through grace to love in every moment. You see Jesus opening her eyes to see how much she can love. And it should open our eyes, too. So, if we look around at the world, and its pain wounds our hearts, when we look around at our loved ones and wonder, what do we do? How do we help them? When we see what Satan is doing all around us, we don't need to look at statistics. We just look at our families. How many of us have been touched by despair, by anxiety among our children, our grandchildren, by suicide, by the desperation of addictive behaviors? See them falling into the deception of promiscuity, forgetting what family is about. And if we're looking at a world that seems ready to blow itself up in hate and we want to do something, we don't just have to sit around and watch this happen. We can do something. We need a miracle, don't we? We need a miracle. That's what our Blessed Mother wants to give us in the flame of love. So I encourage you to please take this to heart. Pray about it. Ask our Blessed Mother to fill you with her love so that you can fill the world with love. And so that in working with her by your willingness to sacrifice and pray, desire and labor, she will be the one who miraculously will light hearts until the whole world comes to her son, until we see the fulfillment of what she promised, the triumph of her immaculate heart. I don't know how long it'll take, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, I don't know, I don't care. I'm just gonna work as hard as I can every moment to bring that about. How can we not when we see so much pain? So give your lives to our Lord. Live Carmel to the full. Fill our lives with grace. Respond to every call to love. When you receive our mother's love, you will know it. You will feel it. And your lives will be called to that love in every moment. 
So for those of you who would like, and don't feel like you have to do this, no, no peer pressure here, but I would like to share with you a beautiful ceremony that I learned from Elizabeth's grandson of how they symbolize this in Hungary. And he says, everyone takes a candle. So are we, have you passed out candles? Are we passing out candles? Hopefully we'll have those out to everyone while I'm speaking and we'll, we'll wrap up here shortly. He says, everyone takes a candle. And they come forward to someone here. Hopefully I will have a candle. And one by one, I light your candle. And I say to you the very words that our Blessed Mother said to this woman when the flame of love began on April 13th. Take this flame I give you. It is the flame of love of my heart. Light your own heart with it and pass it on. And when he gave me this, he told me, make sure you tell them. Make sure you tell them. These are not your words. This is our Blessed Mother speaking to you. Just like she said to Elizabeth, she looks you in the eye and she says, I need your help. Help me save the country. It is time to save the country. It is time to drive out the evil one once and for all. Help me. And so she says to you, take this flame, light your heart with it, and pass it on. So I'll pass out those candles. Hopefully we'll have a candle here for me. And anyone who would like, if you would like, come up and hear our Blessed Mother speak to your heart and let her light your heart so you can love as never before.
prayer of preparation for celebrating the Most Holy Eucharist. Almighty, eternal God, behold, we draw near to the table of your most delightful banquet. As sinners, we trust not in our own merit, but rely on your mercy and goodness. God of loving kindness and awesome majesty, take away all our offenses and sins so that we may be made worthy to taste the holy of holies. We come to the sacrament of your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as one sick to the physician of life, as one unclean to the fountain of mercy, as one blind to the light of eternal brightness, as one poor and needy to the Lord of heaven and earth. We ask, therefore, for the abundance of your immense generosity, that you may graciously cure our sickness, wash away our defilement, give light to our blindness, enrich our poverty, so that we may receive the bread of angels, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, with such reverence and humility, such contrition and devotion, such purity and faith, such purpose and intention, as are conducive to the salvation of our souls. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Declare it to the distant lands. Behold, our Savior will come. You need no longer fear. In nomine Patris et Fili. Et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Dearly beloved, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, 
through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Miseriator nostri omnipotens Deus, et demisis peccatis nostri, Perducat nos ad vitam eterna. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Keep us alert, we pray, O Lord our God, as we await the advent of Christ your Son, so that when he comes and knocks, he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. All nations shall stream toward it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and impose terms on many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not rise the sword against another nor shall they train for war again. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced because they said to me, We will go up to the house of the Lord, and now we have set foot within your gates, O Jerusalem. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Jerusalem, built as a city with compact unity, to it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. 
let us go rejoicing in the house of the Lord. According to the decree for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. In it are set up judgment seats, seats for the house of David. Let us go rejoicing in the house of the Lord. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. May peace be within your walls, prosperity in your buildings. Let us go rejoicing. Because of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will pray for your good. Let us go rejoicing. Alleluia. Come and save us, Lord our God. Let your face shine upon us that we may be saved. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion approached him and appealed to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, suffering dreadfully. He said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion said in reply, Lord, I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man subject to authority with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go. He goes, and to another, come here, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Amen, I say to you, in no one in Israel, have I found such faith? I say to you, many will come from the east and the west and will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As we celebrate Advent, we begin by acknowledging that we are not of this world that our souls are immortal and we are made not for this life, but for eternal life. And this truth doesn't come natural. We don't immediately notice that or are aware of it. It's only by a revelation of love that we can experience a revolution of our life, beginning by how we think to be renewed, to be transformed in our hearts by the renewal of our minds. And God, in unveiling his heart to us, unveiling his life to us, revealing his face to us, shows us the full reality 
of what makes life so, so beautiful. And that ultimate reality of the beauty of life is him. And we're made for him. He is all. He alone is all and everything that makes life worth living and utterly beautiful. And it's for this beauty of the fullness of life, which is love, that for which we are made. And that, this, the discovery of that beauty ignites fire in our souls. And it's only God who can ignite that. It's only God who can enkindle that fire because that fire is, it's a supernatural flame. It doesn't come from the flesh. It's not a flame of the flesh, of the earthly passions. It's a heavenly fire. And it's God's desire for us. God who desires us to be one with him through Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate fire of God's heart. God is a consuming fire of a life of love that is eternal. And he so loved the world that he made us for this life of love. But because humanity had made such a mess of God's gift of creation. The Lord needed to send his son for our redemption, to allow grace to become greater than the mess that we cause in creation. And so it's only this fire of love that purifies us from the brokenness that comes from the mess, that mess that begins with disobedience whenever we say no to God's invitation of love. Whenever we say no to God's revelation of truth. Whenever we try to exchange what God offers for some human invention or exchange God's wisdom for human understanding, God's will for our own human pursuit. Whenever we do that, whenever we break this covenant with God, whenever we break covenant with God, communion with God, the sacredness of a, a right relationship with God, the breaking of this covenant through his commandments, breaking his commandments, always means the breaking of our lives. And the only thing that can, break, that can bring our broken lives back together again, the only thing that can heal us, is love. And the healing, the healing expression of love is most best expressed in sacred scripture as fire. That's, what fi that's one of the properties of fire is that it heals. It purifies, heals, it restores, it can forge two different metals into one. And so this transformative property of fire, which has the cap capacity to transform into itself whatever it burns, God desires to transform us into, its, into himself. That we may be one. As the Father is one with the Son. And what is that union of the Father and the Son but the Holy Spirit? The union of love of the Father and the Son is, this, is the, living, the living flame of that love that unites them as one is the Spirit. And so the flame of love that flows incandescently like a fountain from the purity of Mary's beauty from the purity of Mary's love for the Trinity, from the pure beauty of her love, her union with the Father as the most perfect daughter of the Father ever, the new Eve, 
the pure beauty of her perfect love with the Son as the mother of the Savior, who contained in her womb him whom the whole cosmos could not contain, namely its creator. The pure beauty of her communion with the spirit of the living God as her own spouse. That fire of God, refulgent in this woman, is what has, is, is the way by which God desires to bring about his ultimate revolution in the world. The revolution of Christ and his gospel through the purity of Mary. One of the great, the greatest story, this, in saying the greatest is subjective, it's in many ways, just a matter of personal preference. But one of the, at least one of the most popular stories among the desert fathers, who are those valiant, heroic men of the fourth century, who were not no longer able to give their lives to Christ in martyrdom. And so after the legalization of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire and the, and the Western world, Martyrdom was no longer a possibility. And yet these men were ignited by this fire of desire to give their souls completely to Jesus Christ in total sacrifice, that they wanted to embrace the cross as much as they could in the best way possible. And so they went out into the desert to, to live an ascetical life of prayer and sacrifice. And they grew in the life of grace in a profound way that made them sages of the spiritual life, beacons of luminaries of God's light, God's word and his wisdom. And among these stories of the Desert Fathers, the, one of the most popular and my favorite is Abba Joseph. And I've shared this story with many of you, many people before, and many of you have probably heard me share it in the past. One of the novices comes to Abba Joseph and he says, look, I'm, I'm doing all of my duties. I'm fulfilling all of the rules. I'm doing A, B, C, D. I pray in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening. I fast on, you know, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I offer this, I do that, yada, yada, yada. He, he checked all the boxes on his list. And he's like, I still feel like something's missing. Something's still missing. So he's going to Abba Joseph to say, I still feel like, now I'm, I'm paraphrasing, there's still, I still feel this hole in my soul. There's still something missing. And his answer is, if you will, you can become all flame. And some translations say you can become totally transformed into fire. A similar story is heard by a more contemporary saint from Russia, one of the favorite saints of Pope St. John Paul II, Seraphim of Sarah who lived so well, lived up to his name of the seraphim. The angels were most close to the heart of God and are filled with the fire of God's life. And Saint Seraphim of Russia, who was a contemporary of Saint Therese, lived in the, 19, the, end, the latter part of the 19th century. A similar story is accounted that one of his novices, which is like someone studying under him, a student, learning from the teacher, came up to him and said the same thing. But according to the standards of that day and age in terms of what do I need to do to be holy? He checked off all of his lists. He says, there's still something lacking in me. And his response was similar to Abba Joseph's in the fourth century. However, with Saint Seraphim, if I remember this story correctly, he just gazed up towards heaven with his hands in the air of in, this, in the Oron's position of adoration, 
and his fingers began to become each little torches, little flames of fire. And he became transfigured. And the light, the, t the, the taboric light, the light that trans of which Jesus was transfigured on Mount Tabor, completely transfigured his countenance. And he said something to the effect of Abba Joseph, if you will, you can become also fire. Our friend John Sullivan, by the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit's anointing upon him, so well communicated to us about the essence of the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary as not simply being another devotion, not simply being another movement, not simply being for this group uh, of folks that meet at a such and such an hour uh, and do these X, Y, Z, the, this list of prayers and sacrifices during the week and follow this routine. It's not even simply for the however many Catholics is estimated to be in the, in the world, but all of humanity falls under this longing gaze of God to draw all to his sacred heart and to do so through the immaculate heart of her who most burned with love for God, who was most full of grace, the only one full of grace, as full of grace, as close to full of grace as was Jesus himself. And one of the important points in addition to that that John shared with us is that it's, it's one thing to say the flame of love prayers and our Blessed Mother doesn't ask for much. But it's important not to lose the forest for the trees. To not focus so much on the external, the externals of the devotion or the, the observances or of how to live a life of sacrifice and not to lose the heart and soul of the way of life that it calls us to. Namely, the inner life of Jesus and Mary. And he referred often to how much the spirituality of the flame of love echoes karma. It communicates the essence of the Carmelite saints, their spirituality and wisdom in terms of being called to being totally transformed into love and to become love as God is love in the world. One little act of love at a time. And as John pointed out, and he so well communicated without referencing Therese directly, the little way of Therese in terms of the kind of sacrifices that were called to become creative in making, to become dynamically disposed to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and what it means to creatively live in God's presence, aware in whose presence we are and in, in whom we live, move, and have our being. And when we live more fully in this active friendship of God's living presence, as the very air that we breathe, abiding in him, with him and through him, then we become more aware, the big buzzword outside of the Catholic Church that comes from Buddhism but is pretty popular with people of all walks of life is mindfulness, being mindful of what matters most, becoming aware, or St. Teresa used to word, use the word recollection, the unity prayer says living in harmony uh, with God, our souls being in harmony with, with the soul of Christ. It's when we're living with that kind of conscious awareness that we can become dynamically disposed to the creative inspiration of the moment and what it means to choose love, to live love. And then that, can be, that becomes gradually more and more as we become purified by the flame of love. As St. John of the Cross, the great Carmelite do mystical doctor talks about, 
as we become gradually more and more purified by the living flame of God's love and what it means to love in God's image and likeness, what it means to love not simply on the natural level, which is so stuck in self-will, disordered self-love and self-importance, where we become purified from that kind of love and learn to love more in accord and in harmony with the heart of God, revealed in Christ crucified, then we can become more and more free to discover our identity, to become love as God is love. And that's our vocation. As St. Therese so well said, my vocation is love. To be love in the heart of the church, which means in the heart of the church, she was referencing the heart and the body is hidden, it's unseen, it's not the hands, it's not the feet, it's not the face. It's a hidden presence of love in the world. And it's that love of the heart, figuratively speaking, but the beating of that heart that communicates, that extends, or that keeps the blood flowing through the rest of the body. And it's that hidden activity of the heart beating with love that gives life to the rest of the body. So we are called to the hidden life of love above all else because that's where the miracles take place. The hidden life of love through prayer and sacrifice is what allows God to be God and to do what God does best which is convert us into his image and likeness, unite us to himself. And when, we, when we're united to him, like St. John of the Cross talks about, in the beginning, that requires the purification of all kinds of selfish inclinations and defects of temperament. And it purifies us of that. And the more closer we get to the heart of God, the calmer becomes the fire. The more beautiful and smooth and soothing and warming and transforming becomes the fire. So we become totally one with the fire. Or we become totally love, as God is love, deified in the life of God himself. This is why Mary is such a huge instrument of God, the author of miracles. Because from the very beginning of her conception, she was all fire. She was full of grace. There was no defect in her. Nothing that could hinder the action of God. Nothing that inhibited the life of the Spirit. She, from the very beginning, was this fountain of goodness, beauty, truth, life of God. And it's when we grow in this life of grace, through her help, who obtains for us far more than we could ever do for ourselves, it's the more that we do that we can begin to forget ourselves, forget our, our little lists, Forget our attachment to results. Forget our clinginess to want to control outcomes, to want to see the results and the, and, the, and the evidence. We begin to be free the more we forget ourselves and are just more and more aflame with the life of love. And that's when the miracles really begin. The more it's less of me and more of him. And that's what God wants. And that is what most glorifies him. And that's what saves souls. As we celebrate this Eucharist, we celebrate this action of God, this redemption of God as the all consuming fire. 
and we receive this fire, the very being of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into our body. That we may be consumed by what we consume. That we may be totally converted into that with which we eat. Love. The sacrament of life in God, which is love. As we receive this flame of love through the Holy Eucharist, the heart of Jesus, we, re we ask Mary to prepare us with her dispositions, which we see so well communicated through St. Therese, the dispositions of humble gratitude and audacious confidence in God. That we may walk in the light of the Lord, as Isaiah said in the first reading, the way of freedom and confidence. And thus be Mary's ambassadors. Ambassadors of her beauty. The way of the flame that consumes her soul. And that, that what's in her may also be in us. As John so well said, for those in your family who you love so much, especially maybe your children or grandchildren, especially those who don't even know the Lord, but are such good people that you work, that you know at work, as including those who are most in need of God's mercy, who are furthest away from them, that we can begin to love them as God loves them, with the flame of his love ignited in our souls. And just like those people whom God ignites a desire that they may know the Lord, and how much we would love to be able to take what God has put in us, due to no merit of our own, but a mystery of his will, to take what he has given us as pure grace, a sheer gift, and as if we could, would that we could just be able to just put our hand on their head, and just like that, they would get it. Get the flame. Would that it would be that easy. Our Blessed Mother wants to put the flame that's in her heart in ours. As we receive this flame, may we magnify the Lord and, and live already in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Let us stand now and present our prayers before the light of God's face. We pray for the church as the prophecy of all nations coming to the Lord's mountain is fulfilled, that the genius and gifts of each nation may be welcome in her midst. We pray to the Lord, Lord that swords may be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and our world may know the blessing of peace. We pray especially for peace in the Holy Land, in Ukraine and Armenia and throughout the world. We pray to the Lord, Lord that we may be given the faith and the humility of the centurion, drawing out from Jesus his power of miracles on behalf of our loved ones. We pray to the Lord. For all who are sick or paralyzed in any way, like the centurion's servant, that they may have friends who will approach Jesus on their behalf to obtain healing and peace. We pray to the Lord. For our beloved dead, that they may go up to the house of the Lord and set foot joyfully within the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem. We pray to the Lord. For the special intentions which we each carry in our hearts. especially for Carmina Doria's intentions, 
for whom this Mass is being offered. And for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in our souls and in our families, and that we may bring through generosity of prayer and sacrifice, bring forth a harvest of souls to Jesus. We pray to the Lord. For this, let us pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace, of thy flame of love, over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We make all of our prayers with confidence through Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Benedictus est Domine Deus Universus, qui ad tua largitate accepimus panem, quem tibi offerimus fructum tere, et operis manum omine, et suo nobis fiet panis vite. Benedictus Deus in secula. Blessed be God forever. Benedictus es Domine Deus Universus, qui ad tua largitate accepimus vinum, quod tibi offerimus fructum vitis, et operis manum omine, ex quo nobis fiet fotus spiritali. Benedictus Deus in secula, Blessed be God forever.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Except we pray, O Lord, these offerings we make, gathered from among your gifts to us. And may what you grant us to celebrate devoutly here below gain for us the prize of eternal redemption through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We Let us give thanks to the It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed at his first coming the lowliness of human flesh, and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago and opened for us the way to eternal salvation. That when he comes again in glory and majesty and all is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hold. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabao, Veni Sunceri Eterna, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in Excel. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly, for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and Jose, our Archbishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic, and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, 
and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. For the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Quam oblationem tu deu. In omnibus fuesumus, benedicta ad scriptam rata, rationabilem, acceptabilem que facere digneris, ut nobis corpus et sanguis, Fiat delectissimi fili tui, Domini nostri, Iesu Christi. Qui pridie quam patere tu, Accepit panem in sancta, Ac venerabiles manus suas, et elevatis oculis in celum, at te Deum Patrem Sum Omnipotentem, tibi gratias agens benedici, Regis, dedit que discipulis suis dicens. Accipite et manducate ex hoc omnes. Hoc est en in corpus meiu. Quod provobis tradetus.
Simili modo pos quam cenas cum est. Ad cipiens et hunc preclarum calicem, in sancta sac venerabiles manus suas. Item tibi gratias agens benedici, Dedit que decipuli suis dice. Ad cipit et bibit ex se omne. Hic est en in calix sanguinis mei. Novi et aterni testamenti, qui probobis et promutis effunde tu. In remissionem peccatorum, hoc facit en meam commemorazione. Mysterium Fidei Mortem Tuam Annunciamus Domine Et Tuam Resurrexit Undet memores domine nos servitui, serer plebs tua sancta, eius dem Christi fili tui dom, Domini nostri, tam peate passiones, nec non et ab inferis resurrectiones, seret in celos gloriose ascensiones. Oferimus preclare maestati tue, De tuis donis ac datis, ostiam puram, ostiam sancta, ostiam immaculata, panem sanctum vite eterne, et calicem salutis perpetue. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as ones who are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, 
Command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, through those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The power of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace 
and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I in you stay, we toll as peccata mundi. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, you bear the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit through your death gave life to the world. Free us by this, your most holy body and blood, from every, from all our sins of which we are guilty. Keep us always faithful to your commandments and never let us be far from you. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Come, O Lord, visit us in peace, that we may rejoice before you with a blameless heart. Let us pray. May these mysteries, O oh Lord, 
in which we have participated. Profit us, we pray. For even now, as we walk amid passing things, you teach us by them to love the things of heaven and hold fast to what endures. Through Christ our I want to give a blessing to the Healing Prayer Ministry, who I believe is going to be meeting as usual on Mondays. So for all those who are intercessors in the Healing Prayer Ministry, I want to give you a blessing as you pray for others. Lord Jesus Christ, as you were moved by the faith of the soldier in today's gospel, may you inspire Resurrection faith in your intercessors and your sons and daughters who are in need of healing, that they all may experience you as the author of miracles, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And by the power of your gift of faith, may your grace of healing love be manifest. We ask this in the holy name of Jesus, our Lord. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. prayer of thanksgiving by St. Thomas Aquinas. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you. For though we are sinners and your unprofitable servants, you have fed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. You did this not because we deserved it, but because you are kind and merciful I pray that this Holy Communion may not add to our guilt and punishment, but may lead to forgiveness and salvation. May it be for us the armor of faith and the shield of good will. May it purify us from evil ways and put an end to our base passions. May it bring us charity and patience humility and obedience, and may it strengthen our power to do every kind of good. May it be a strong defense against the snares, the deceit of all our enemies, visible and invisible. May it calm perfectly all our evil impulses, bodily and spiritual. May it unite us more closely to you, the one true God. May it bring us full possession of the goal we are longing for. And I pray that you will lead us sinners to the magnificent banquet where you, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, are for all your saints the true light, total fulfillment, everlasting joy, gladness without end, exquisite delight, and most perfect happiness. Grant this through Christ our Lord. St. Michael the Archangel, Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him while we pray. Do that, the Prince of the Heavenly Host. By the power of God, cast into hell, Satan, all the evil spirits. Fall back, O Lord. 
Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Ducero, et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus, exules fili. Gementes et flentes in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo arvocata nostra I want to thank again John Sullivan for uh, being with us and express my appreciation for the anointing that the Holy Spirit has given you for the body of Christ. Um, if I may dare to say this, it was a blessing in disguise uh, that you were called not to the Carmelites, but to the lay vocation, because you'll have much less you won't, your wings won't be able to be clipped as readily as you would be if you were a priest under obedience. Um, and, may, and I pray that you may follow in the footsteps of uh, the head of the Legion of Mary. What was his name? Frank Duff? Frank Duff, yeah. May you follow in the footsteps of Frank Duff in, in Jesus' name. Also, I, um, as I was praying the Eucharistic prayer and, and, and just abiding in the Lord, one thing that, some insights that came to me about the flame of love in, regard, in respects to Advent. Advent is a preparation, part of Advent, the spirit, the spirit of Advent is a preparation for the second coming of Christ, which is the victory of victories. And what the flame of love is about as being more than just a devotion or a movement, it's preparing the way for the consummation of all things in Christ through the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's what the flame of love is. It's the consummation of all things in divine love, the victory of love over evil once and for all, the final word of God as the defining moment of victory. When, all, when God shall be all in all. And we know that, the, that purification will come by way of fire. Not by water, but by fire will come the consummation of all things. And so we're called to be part of this mission of God's merciful love to embrace the whole world. For he doesn't want anyone to be lost, 
but to all to come to union with him. And it's by sacrifice, as St. Therese, the, the teacher of the little way, taught us, suffering alone gives birth to souls. And it's by his death that he gave life to the world. So it's when we unite ourselves to his five wounds that we're able to give life to the world. That we're able to ignite the world with the fire of love. May our lives be consumed by this flame so that by our little seeds of sacrifice through love, we may have the joy of sharing in the harvest of God, his hunger to save souls, to be united with his love forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Alleluia. Have a good night.